So in this installment of the Vanity Build, I'm going to be showing you how I worked on the two front doors as well as the decorative pillars um, on the edge. So we're going to start with the doors and then finish up with those pillars. And then that takes about 15 minutes of footage. So I'm probably going to stop there and then show the facades for the all the drawer boxes next week. So to start, I found the center of my opening and I calculated for the hinges I'm using, which are about a half inch overlay. So you're gonna to wanna to decide what hinges you're using before figuring out these measurements. So you can see I put a mark on the, the vertical part of the plywood there that calculates for that overlay. And then I can measure from that mark to the center of the cabinet, kind of drew out those measurements on that piece of plywood. And then I could rip down my oak this is three quarter inch oak. It's the same stack that I ordered originally. And I ripped this down. I believe these were two inch rails and styles was basically what I decided to do for, for the doors. So I'm just gonna rip a bunch of this wood down into those two inch sections and then I could work from there. I measured my opening, which is about 19 inches. So I'm gonna make these a little bit smaller than 19 so I could set up a stop on the radial arm saw and cut all of the the vertical styles for this at 19 inches um, there's going to be two doors per cabinet so that is is eight styles so then the rails are going to go across the top and I usually um, have about a half inch groove which will then translate to a half inch tongue on those rails across the top so I can subtract the thickness of the wood minus that groove because you'll need to add that half inch on both sides to your styles and then what I uh, to your rails and then what I like to do is I like to rough cut these pieces I don't cut them to final size because I like to do that towards the end and then I have my stack of rails as well. Once I have the stack of rails and styles, I could go through and put the groove in. The groove is gonna be contingent on the thickness of your, your insert. In my case, I'm using quarter inch oak ply, which is actually about a quarter inch. So you can see I marked that quarter inch based off the center. And then I'm just gonna run a groove flip the board and run a groove down all of my pieces it will leave a little bit of a flange in the middle and i'll remove that on the table saw as well so this is going to be the groove in the center that's how i do it instead of using a dado stack which i could use when you have the table saw set a little off sent off of your center line like this it um, automatically centers that groove on your piece um, by flipping these around and like I said I run all of my pieces through I like to do this once the pieces are cut because it's easier to guarantee that that groove is centered um, when you're working with smaller pieces versus long pieces of lumber that sometimes have bows in them so like I said that leaves a little groove in the center and sometimes you could chisel this out depending on the thickness of it but for this it was thick enough I just decided to just uh, adjust the fence and slide all these pieces through and that will remove that center groove and um, then I'll have the groove in all of my pieces and after this the styles are actually done I'll put those aside and then just work on putting the tongue on on the rails so for the tongue it's basically going to be removing that top piece of material as well as the bottom piece you can see I have it marked out for a half an inch, and then you raise the blade to remove that material. This is a scrap piece. I always get these measurements um, dialed in on a piece of scrap, and then I could go through and run all of my finished pieces through. So you can see you're just gonna flip it over, remove that material on the top and the bottom to create that tongue, and then I could test fit it into, into the style you want it to be a, a snug fit without having to be beat to get in there you can see it's nice and snug my uh, tongue could be a little bit deeper so i'll just move the, the fence over a fraction of the inch, inch do another test piece and get it perfect so once i have my doors lined up you can see they're about 10 and 5 eighths wide so once i have them set up at 10 and 5 eighths i could calculate including that half inch for for the um for the the tongue the tongue that will go in the groove and then I could final cut all of my pieces 
So you can see that this is a final one. It fits in there nicely. I usually do one measure to make sure it's perfect because I have cut my rails wrong before. Measure to make sure it's the thickness I need. And then I could take all of those rough cut pieces to the radial arm cell, cut them down to final size, and put the tongue on them, which is what I'm doing here. So once you have all of those curved cuts, you could slide this across the, the top of the blade like I'm, I'm showing here, and that will create a nice even surface for, for your, your tongue. This is a, some, a little bit of a longer process doing curves like this on the table saw, but usually I have other tools set up for other things. So even with four doors, it's just easy enough, even though it's longer to do it this way. These are the hinges I ordered. They're Blum half inch overlay door hinges. I, they're soft close, so the first thing I do is I turn off the soft close because test fitting them with the soft close on could be a pain. And then these hinges started coming with these plastic inserts on them. I don't love those, so I usually remove those before I begin. Um, I said in the last video, Amazon didn't send me a couple mounting brackets with this shipment, so that's why the doors took a little bit longer um, to, to get done. So then the basic rule of thumb for these is you, you split your, your height of your doors into fifth or sixth, and then do one fifth up from the bottom, one fifth down from the top, and, and, and drill your holes. Usually on doors like this, I come up about 30 inches and, and call it a day. So I made my marks, and then these hinges are, uni are usually universal, so I have a jig that shows where to drill all the holes. I usually hand drill the whole cup um, because all it, it's, it's just a matter of getting that top of the bit flush with the top of the wooden cabinet. You could do this on a drill press, but I've done enough of these that I could get it pretty square with a hand drill. And then I can mount these hinges in, in, the, in the doors, which is just a matter of a couple screws. If you keep those plastic inserts on there, you have to drill um, specific size holes is one of the reasons I, I don't like to use them. I also believe they're more geared towards um, MDF doors and particle boards so they grab onto the material. Since I'm using real lumber, um, I just prefer the screws. So you can see I, I shimmed up the doors a sixteenth of an inch with some pennies. That's going to give me my reveal. And then I can just have the doors in place, mark them where they're going to go. This is why I usually don't add the backer to the end and then I could just pre-drill those holes and mount this do these doors. There's many different ways to do these. With something this big without a backer, it's just easiest to shim it up in place with pennies, get it where I want it, put the marks, and then this was pretty much a perfect fit right off the bat. These, um, these hinges are going to have multiple adjustments, but I like to get them as close to perfect so I don't have to mess with them too much. And then you could see those fit there. I'm going to have to put a, these are, since these are uh, Blum hinges like this, I'll have to put a stop so that they stop at the, the front of the cabinet and don't overextend to the inside. But what I'm looking at right here is that the, the, the side vertical that's left is square. So when I go to make the false fronts for the drawers, I don't have to, to finagle them too much, which they were. So that's pretty much it for the doors on this. I think I come back to them a little later in the build. So then for the columns in the photo, the columns sit on what I'm going to call a plinth. So I have some cutoffs from the, the original square stock I had for making all the legs. And I'm just going to cut that down to the size I want. I believe there was a 3 8 inch reveal around the bottom. I end up changing this design later. I don't think I filmed it. It's essentially I just changed the dimensions of that bottom, this bottom plinth. So I'm not going to refilm it. But this is essentially how I cut those. I just use a stop on my cross cut sled and, and turn those into squares. You can see it's just a matter of sending them all through. And then this is basically what I'm left with. That's the 3 8 inch reveal I'm talking about. I believe I made that a little bigger, um, which is why I changed it. And then I could measure for the columns and start those. So once again, I'm working off of this pre-milled square stock. And then I'm going to um, 
I have this, it, this is a basically going to be a round column with two beads at the top and two beads at the bottom. So I marked on some plywood where those beads are going to be. I have my calipers preset to the size I want, which is the thickness of these plinths. And then I could just um, turn these on the lathe. This was pretty easy as far as turning goes. All I did was make this column round using a roughing gouge. I kept the two square edges on this and then I just made it round to my marks. Pretty simple going through and, and doing that. Like I said, I'm not the world's best turner. So this is probably a faster, more efficient process with someone else, but um, get it to the, the thickness I needed. You could see with the calipers. And then at this point, I'm going to mark where those um, two beads are going to start. So you can see I have my, my plywood gauge on the side there. I could come with a pencil and mark where those beads are going to be, and then I could start forming forming the beads. Now these, I could turn a bead with a, a straight gouge, but I don't have a ton of process, uh, practice with it, and sometimes that leads to, to gouging out the wood. So with this, it's usually a process of using other tools to get those beads, but the, the end result is, is the same. They're very simple. It's just a little bit of a round over on each edges. So I went through with with the marking gouge and, and mark those, and then I could go through and, and rough out those beads. The center portion is going to be a little bit skinnier. You can see I rounded that up, and then I could just clean up those beads at the top and clean up that center center bit as well. So like I said, pretty simple, simple process. This is just cleaning up those beads, turning them a little bit so they are more cylindrical and, and giving a little more shape to them as well. You can kind of see the incremental changes on the, the left hand side there. And then once the lathe turns off, that is going to be the finished finished look. So I could take this out of the lathe and I could cut up, cut off these two edges as well. So there's my finished column um, with the two excess edges. So in order to to make two of these, I decided to turn them into in one 3D circle and then split them down the middle. The problem is, is these columns weren't um, entirely square when I started. So all I did was I put two cleats on either side of the pieces. The cleats are adjustable and I drew a chalk mark on the top and bottom of these. I could send it through the table saw with the blade risen just a bit so that it, it makes a slight curve. You could see I already had a miscut on the bottom and I had to adjust this over. I could see that the curve is now lined up with my, my marks and then I could just start sending this through. So I'm going to raise the blade as I go. This is solid oak so I tried to go up in, in small increments and this didn't quite go through the entire piece, which was a little unfortunate. So I will have to flip it. In order to do that, you could see I flipped it, and then with a flashlight, I could realign, um, because this was off when I flipped it, I could realign that mark by looking through the, the, the curve cuts on the, the cross-cut sled and realigning the blade with where I had already cut it. And then same process, I could slide it through, make sure it was lined up, and then I could finish cutting through the column. So they're showing that my marks lined up from top to bottom, which is important. I don't want any gaps um, on these. So that looks good, and then I could just send it through. It didn't go through by maybe a quarter of an inch and then I could just send this piece through until it's perfectly cut in half. So these were nice clean cuts. I was pretty happy with how this turned out. And then at this point, I can now remove 
this square top and the, the square bottom, which was just excess, which made for easier turning and much easier for cutting these on the, on the table saw. So I have a little spacer because obviously the thickness of the column is thinner than the thickness of the top. So as I cut this through, I didn't want it to bind against the blade. So I have a little piece of plywood. You could kind of see it in the beginning there um, behind the column. I could just line this up with the top side of, of the bead. And I, I left a little bit of excess and I, I shaped those up with a, uh, with a chisel. But that was basically how I cut these down to size. And then there they are fit into the cabinet. You can see now why I resized these plinths. They're just a little bit too big. But that is basically what those are going to look like um, where I have them set up. And then like I said, next week I'll tackle finishing up the columns, doing the false fronts. I also put a back on this and I am still waiting for the customer to tell me what color they want these. So this uh, series might have to be cut short of finishing and then I'll come back to it later once, once they're stained and have a clear coat.